Well, hello. Welcome to my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. This is uh, Dean Tenney. We've been explicating the content outlines of the uh, FINRA exams and test specifications of the NASA exams. And so this explication is on analytical methods. The first thing I would tell you about analytical methods is this is um, not make or break on your exam. Four or five questions, I mean, they're there. Uh, I have dozens of practice questions in the 50 practice questions for you on uh, 65, uh, 66 on these uh, concepts. Uh, I think if people struggle with them sometimes, it's because uh, they're fearful of them and so you just gotta get past that. All right, so what's the time value of money concept? Well, basically what we th say is that dollars today are worth more than the identical number of dollars uh, in the future. So dollars today, are worth more than dollars in the future. So how much more, how less but more, you know, how much more, excuse me, is what we really wanna be able to figure out. And so we wanna talk about some of these uh, concepts, the internal rate of return. You know, for example, when you buy a bond, uh, let's say I buy a bond for 90% of par $900, and it has a 8% coupon. Let's say my yield of maturity on that bond is nine and a half percent. That nine and a half percent represents the internal rate of return from buying that bond today at 900 and holding it to maturity. So the yield of maturity concept is very similar to an internal rate of return calculation. Now, what we probably want to be able to do is turn that into some money, a dollar amount, and see what that is, that you know, net present value of those future income streams. And uh, you know, we've come up with a price. For example, if I do a net present value calculation, on a bond. Remember this thing with the bond, we can go yield price or price yield on a bond, right? So I could talk about a bond's price or I can talk about its yield. But if we take the uh, a net present value of a bond and we you know, figure out what that number is today, let's say I come up with 940 is the net present value of uh, those future income streams on the bond. Then I can mathematically say, okay, well, if I get it for less than that, that's gonna be a good deal. Or more than that, it's not gonna be a good deal. In fact, I could actually, come up with the number that, I'm, uh, that I want to pay based on uh, coming up with whatever the net present calculation is. Now, most of the time on your exam, uh, they're not gonna make you calculate. It depends on your draw. I mean, a, a, you know, I'm wishing for you a dream draw. Everything you studied shows up, but you know, every once in a while you get to face a death draw. And mainly what you have to do, in fact, let me get out my annotation tool, is a lot of times, instead of actually doing the math, what you've got to do is just recognize or be able to pick out that formula in a uh, lineup. All right, so they'll show you some formulas and say which one of these is, you know, the net present value calculation. So that more often than not, that's what you gotta do. Now here we're gonna work an example where, you know, I uh, wanna, I'm going to have 50,000 in five years, I'm expecting a 10% return. What is the present value of that number today? So that's what we're gonna figure out uh, first in terms of doing this uh, net present value. You know, as I mentioned to you in a bond, uh, we would set the net present value to zero. That's what internal rate return is all about. But let's just uh, take a look at the math that would be involved in figuring this uh, formula out. As I mentioned, more often than not, what you're gonna have to do is not actually do the formula, but actually just kind of recognize it. So we take our 50,000. By the way, on the test, you're always gonna get two of the three things. So. I highly recommend the practice questions I have for you. So they're either going to give you the internal rate, or excuse me, the uh, number of compounding periods, five years, that'll always be given. The expected return will always be given. And then they're either going to give you the future value or present value. So that kind of sets you in the right direction of what they're asking you to do. So what they're asking you to do is actually either go future value to present value, which I'm doing now, or present value to future value. And again, I don't think they're gonna to have to do the math, just more of an illustration uh, of what you're gonna do. Now we're expecting in our, our example here, we're expecting 10%, so one plus 0 0.0. And then compounding period, let's see if I'm gonna be able to get my computer to do the compounding thing. Woohoo. <laughs> um, and we're gonna do that, right? And then we uh, say, okay, that's gonna give us our present value, whatever that number is, right? Um, 
when we take the 50,000 and we divide that by when we do the, uh, the compounding period, we find out that that's one, one point six one. Oh, five one. And then when we uh, do that math, we find out that the net present value is uh, 31,000. 4607. Now, again, uh, I would primarily want you to be able to do in this uh, is just show you the formula, have you pick up that out of a lineup. I'm not really interested in can you do that math in terms of passing your exam, but I do want you to be able to put that uh, pick that out of there. I would like you to recognize that uh, in total rate of return sets that net present value at zero. Let's put that there. Let's put that a different color. And I've had the general understanding that I gave you about the yield of maturity is similar to IRR. We can do that calculation. All right, so uh, moving on descriptive statistics here. I uh, put a sequence of numbers here to look at. And what I'd be interested in being able to do now, again, our time together is a buffet, but what I like to do is I like to sort the numbers out. So this could be the return of a mutual fund, the return of a, st a stock, whatever the case is. Who cares? We're just talking about descriptive statistics in terms of a test issue. And so what I would do is I'd like to say, okay, well, I'm looking at these numbers. These are just given numbers again. So I just made these up. I'd like to say, okay, well, I got a negative 4%. Uh, I've got going from, lar uh, uh, from the negative number to the larger number, right? So I got a negative 4, and then I got a 3%. And then I have an 8%. And then I have another 8%. I'm just putting in some order that makes sense to me. And then I have a 10%. So now I've just put those in a, uh, a sequence that makes sense to me. Now, the mean is the simple average, the simple average. So let's put that here, get a different color. I would be prepared on your test to do a simple average, you know, whether it's dollar cost averaging or, you know, whatever it happens to be. Uh, that's what you're going to do. Now, if we add up all those numbers, uh, if we add up uh, negative four, three, eight, eight, and 10, we're going to end up with a 25. So we're just simply going to sum those numbers. So negative four, um, negative four. We got uh, plus three, we got uh, plus eight. Plus three, plus eight, plus eight, plus 10. And if we sum those numbers, uh, we end up with 25. And then we simply, to get this simple average, just divide that by the number of occurrences and we get the mean here of uh, five. I would be able to uh, do that on your exam, uh, whether it's dollar cost average, because at some point you're gonna have to get simple average of something. So, you know, I'd be able to do that math. The median is the middle number. Uh, I'm trying to put that in different colors here. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I told you what I would do is look at the uh, middle number, which is going to be the A, right? We got negative four, three, eight, eight, and that's the middle number. And so in our example, uh, the middle number is going to be uh, eight. Uh, the mode is the uh, number that occurs most often. And again, what I'm simply trying to do here is 
put in a different color, you know, the stuff that I'm adding to this. Uh, by the way, I cleaned up the uh, the PDF that NASA provides to make our annotation a little you know, nicer, but it's the same document. I highly recommend you print the PDF, have it as you're studying, have it as you're going through these explications with me. If you have any questions, put them in the comment box and I answer pretty quickly. Uh, but you also wanna use this as your own intellectual inventory, the PDF that NASA provides, you know, uh, if it's not on the PDF, they're not allowed to ask it. I mean, it's, you know, if it is on the PDF, then they are allowed to ask it. As we said, the uh, medium is the middle number. The mode is the number that occurs most often. And here uh, in our sequence, I just made up our, our mode, the number that occurs most often is eight. And the range, you know, is the difference between the two the difference between those two numbers. Uh, from small to high. You know, I kind of think of it as a thermometer. You know, I'm teaching series three. You know, when I'm trying to get people to understand this, what I usually use is the thermometer. And so, you know, we were in negative four degrees. So the range is the difference between the lowest, let's sort of put our definition there, the difference between the lowest number and the highest number. And here that would be negative four uh, to 10. And so the range here was a 14. You know, and the way I think of it is we went from four to below zero on a thermometer to you know, uh, 10 degrees uh, above zero on a thermometer, we've actually increased uh, 14 degrees. It's warmed up 14 degrees. So you live in a place like uh, you know Minneapolis, you know maybe that's a heat wave. So, <laughs> so all right. So what's our next one here? There were four or five questions on this stuff. Uh, our next one here is standard deviation. Not going to make you uh, uh, do any math on standard deviation, but one thing I would want you to understand is if you understand these formulas, and again, I have some practice questions for you. Standard deviation, you can distinguish that between alpha and beta, and one of the ways you can distinguish that is because you can say, well, gee, you know, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the market as a whole, where if it's an alpha or beta or something like that, there's got to be something in the question about that. But what the standard deviation does, is measure the level of risk or volatility of an asset. Let me fix that. Uh, and how widely spread or the uh, is that volatility? You know, when I show you a chart, you know, of a standard deviation, I'd say, well, listen, this uh, is unlikely to occur. You know, sometimes I see people misusing statistics, like to say this is a thousand year flood, just means standard deviation says that that shouldn't happen. That would be the tail end of that. Uh, you know, if you're not a math person, I would know that uh, one standard deviation, let's just put a, a measurement here. Uh, one standard deviation, oh, sorry, let me get a different color again. Uh, one standard deviation means that the uh, dispersal volatility will be within those, whatever those two numbers we establish are, 67% uh, of the time. And uh, two standard deviations means it would be uh, within that 92% of the time, that dispersal, that volatility. You know, I usually, when I'm teaching class, use Apple, say, look, if we looked at standard deviation on an Apple, you know, 92% of the time, it's gonna be between 100 and 150, whatever the math uh, shows us, right? And then some things will be more volatile than other things if we when we do that math. So two standard deviations means it will be there within 92% of the time. Um, I don't like the way, you know, one of the, the challenges on um, 
NASA is there's really just no flow with NASA. I mean, you know, for me, I'd probably talk about beta before I actually uh, talk about uh, uh, alpha, you know, because beta test question, beta is a measurement of a stock or bond or st stock or mutual funds volatility as compared to the market as a whole. So, you know, it's part of the capital asset uh, pricing model, which we'll talk about in a future explication. But for right now, and let's just put that there. We'll do beta first and we'll circle back. It is a measurement of a stock or, you know, funds, mutual fund volatility as compared to the market as a whole. Uh, I don't know of any draw where you don't get to ask something about beta as, as that relates. So a beta would mean uh, twice as well as the under, underlying market. Uh, you know, the beta of an S&P 500 track fund would be one, whatever the market does, that's what it does. And that's what we would expect. Now, if I prided myself, I guess, on I, as a money manager, I might say, well, listen, you know, so what that the market went up, uh, you know, uh, 13% and I got you uh, 13%. There was no added value that you could have done that in an index fund because that's what the market returned. But, you know, level of risk, I might need to be go a little faster to get where you're going. And so I would use uh, beta to do that. Uh, so alpha is the return. Let's first put that in there. So let's put that, let's get a different color here. I think of uh, alpha. as the returns in excess of uh, beta. And you know, let's just put excess returns in terms of the market. So here, I just want to give you a little example of uh, alpha. And so we say a stock has a beta 1.4. That means it's 1.4 uh, times more volatile uh, than the market. And then we say that uh, we have, uh, the market has returned 13%. The actual return, was uh, 9%. And uh, we say that the risk-free rate of return is uh, 3%. And so the way we're gonna do that, let's get a different color here. Um, you know, sometimes people miss questions because we can assume whatever risk-free rate of return we want. Some people use treasury notes, some people use T-bills, but you know, it's given information here is 3%. So my point is don't get too hung up on that. All right, so here our, our market return, our market return uh, was uh, 13%. Let me get a different color. So 13%, let me put in parentheses just to match it up. Uh, our risk-free rate of return was a given information that was 3%. And then we're gonna times that by the beta. And the beta here was uh, 1.4. And so when we do the uh, 1.13 uh, minus three times 1.4, we're expecting a 14% return. So as your money manager, I might say, well, why are you gonna pay me for that? And you know, if I alpha would be what I can get in excess of that. So as you re, re, have, see here, boom, we did uh, 19%. Let me get a different color again. We did a uh, 19%. And then we're just going to back out what the market, we thought the, the uh, market was going to give us, right? So we got 19 uh, minus what we could have got for not playing, which was the 3% risk-free return. That's what you get for not playing. So that means we got uh, 16 and, and uh, we were expecting to get 14. And so here we have positive alpha. We actually have 2% in alpha. So as your money manager, I say, hey, listen, I did a return to us 2% uh, in positive alpha. 
And again, I wouldn't get too hung up on the math as much as the general kind of understanding or takeaway uh, from these issues uh, on your exam. All right, so let's just review some of the, by the way, remember just four or five. So I'm, unfortunately, we got to show you a lot more uh, because, you know, who knows which ones you're going to get. So we're talking about analytical methods, four or five questions. We're talking about uh, time value money. We said the internal rate of return, we set that back to zero for internal rate of return. And we said in a uh, bond, that's going to be yield to maturity. Oh, looks like I need to fix that up. Set to zero. Similar, and then what I meant to say there, it looks like I messed up. Bonds, yield to maturity is similar to the IRR. And we said you can uh, do the net present value calculation to determine whether the bond is a good deal at the price. You know, we set net price, present value to 940, and we can get it for less than that. That's a good deal based on our math, or higher than not such a good deal. Uh, I gave you an example. I told you I want you mainly to be able to pick out that formula. Not so much can you do it. You're getting a simple function calculator, so that's not really what we're interested in. Uh, but I would want you to be able to pick out that formula. But I did give you an example here of a present value calculation. You know, 50000 to in five years is not as valuable as X number of dollars today. And so, as we said, you're always going to get as a given the uh, uh, years, the time, and you're always going to get the uh, expected return and you're either gonna get the present value or the future value. Here you were given the future value, so we're gonna go for the present value, which is a little lower number. Sometimes that alone can do it for you. Here we said that we're expecting a 50,000 in five years and we can get a 10% return. So if we can get a 10% return, what is 50 grand worth today? And so we plug it into our formula and we say, assuming we can get 10%, you know, uh, 50,000 10 year, uh, five years from today would be 31,000 uh, $47.07. And then we uh, talked about descriptive statistics. I just made up a series of numbers, 10%, negative 4, 8, 3, 8. This could be the return of a fund. It could be a stock. You know, who cares? We said that descriptive statistics means you're going to have to know the mean or simple average. That's testable. And somehow, some way, I said you're going to have to do that. And we said the mean is the simple average. And we just uh, totaled up the numbers. We divided by 5. We got our mean. We said the medium is the middle number. I think of the medium on the freeway, right? The medium is what separates, you know, the uh, you know northbound and southbound uh, lanes or east or westbound lanes. Stay off the median, right? Uh, we said the mode is the off number that occurs most often. By the way, I showed you math here, but I would just, you know, this is good flashcard fodder. Just make sure you know which one's which, right? They could just put that in an answer set and ask you which one's which. And we said the range is the uh, difference between the lowest number and the highest number. And we said uh, standard deviation, standard deviation is the dispersal uh, of the numbers uh, between a level of risk and volatility of an asset. And, uh, you know, the wider that dispersal is, the more risk that's going to have, right? And uh, we just uh, talked about one standard deviation being 67% and two standard deviations being 92%. That's where we would see the pattern in terms of the price movement of uh, involatility. We said alpha is excess return, seeking alpha. That's a big website that people go to seeking alpha. So that's excess returns. I mean, you know, the point here again is we shouldn't be uh, getting too much. I don't know, I shouldn't say too much. I get prejudicial, but, you know, alpha, seeking alpha means I want excess returns. I'm going to take risk to do so. But, you know, we have certain expectations based on the beta. We said beta is very, very testable. You know, beta is a measurement of a stock or fund's volatility as compared to the market as a whole. And alpha would be that excess return. And so here I showed you an example of a stock that had a beta 1.4, meaning it's 1.4 times more volatile than the market. Now, remember that goes both ways, up or down, right? The market returned 13%. Uh, we've got a 19% return and we assume the risk-free rate of return is 3%. Remember, we assume whatever that number is. So we are making some assumptions when doing math. So to figure out the uh, alpha, we took uh, the 13% that the market gave us. We uh, took the risk-free rate of return. I think a risk-free rate of return is what you get for not playing, right? So I didn't need to risk my capital to get 3%. So we were expecting based on beta to get a 14% return. We actually got 19%. And again, we're gonna back out what we could have bought, you know, T-bills or T-notes or whatever we used as our risk-free rate, rate of return. And so we got 16, we were expecting 14. So I feel pretty good. We got 2% and positive, positive alpha. So pretty cool. 
Uh, sharp ratio, uh, sharp ratio. I'm not going to make you do anything uh, with the sharp ratio, but again, you know, it comes down to, uh, you know, comparing asset manager perhaps. And I, I said, well, listen, I'm not really willing to admit that that guy did a better job than me. I mean, you know, what level of risk did he take uh, to get you that level of return? So the sharp ratio is a uh, financial metric. Again, I'm not going to make you do it. I'm just going to ask you to do it. And this involves the uh, standard deviation, risk-free and standard deviation. And what I'm saying is, did I deliver the same return to you uh, without taking the risk? And, you know, so two portfolios. The one with the higher sharp ratio, that's the test question, by the way, is just higher sharp ratio is good. I mean, you know, I didn't take, I got a return without taking all the risk that maybe my competitor took, for example. So higher, let's just put that higher sharp ratio is good. Uh, correlation, I don't know of any draw on your exam where you're not gonna get a question about negative correlation. So, you know, good news, I guess, or bad news, depending on whether you like this section. We said in this entire section, there's four or five questions and we do know a couple of them. And so that by process of elimination, we can decide, well, how important are the rest of them, right? But negative correlation means uh, things that go opposite directions. Yeah, let's, I guess, start with positive. Positive is not the test question. Negative is, but positive correlation means two assets. Two assets, two assets that move in the same direction. Yeah, the one I usually use in class is, you know, Ford and GM. I mean, for all intents and purposes, right? If you have Ford in your portfolio already and I buy your GM, I haven't really diversified you at all because those two securities have the same correlation. They move in the same direction. Uh, no, uh, no correlation means there's no discernible pattern. I wouldn't worry about that. And then, as I mentioned, I'll get a, whoop. Uh, let's see here, there we go. Uh, I'll put this in caps, because this is uh, definitely something you gotta be able to have an understanding of. You know, there's no draw in which this concept is not going to come up. Now, this may not be true, but for test purposes, right? Your your fantasy test uh, fantasy land. Uh, for example, we might put some gold in your portfolio, thinking precious metals are going to have negative correlation to financial assets. Right, or we might use uh, real estate for negative correlation. You know, so I could say to you, well, listen, I added this to your portfolio because if the other things go down, this thing goes up, this asset goes up. Now, usually what they do is they show you an answer set and ask you to pick out which one would provide uh, the additional diversification and what you'll be looking for. And they'll give you the correlation number and ask you to pick it, or they'll ask you to pick the asset class more likely to have a negative correlation. So. That is certainly one of the four or five that you're going to find in this section on your, your exam. Uh, P.S. This is going to be in the 65 uh, playlist and the 65, uh, 66 day, day playlist. The PDF here is exactly the same in this area. So just so you know, don't freak out. It says series 66 if you're watching this in the 65 playlist because I put it right in the section it belongs into in that PDF. So there's no difference between the two. So please don't freak out. Don't start sending me all kinds of emails. Say, hey, Dean, I'm looking at this thing. It says 66. I'm a 65. The analytical uh, tools here that we're using are the same on both exams, same number of questions, the same exact test concepts. So I'm just not going to label this 65, 66. As you see here in the 66, this starts with economic factors because the people taking the 66 have a seven. My 65 candidates, as you know, your uh, explication starts with economics. You know, the assumption seven's already had that. So you start with the economics, which I've already explicated for you. 
financial reporting, which I've already explicated for you. And then the third section is what we're doing now in your playlist. For our 66s, this is the first uh, part of their explication. So if that didn't make any sense, send me an email or put it in the comment box and I'll, I'll try again to get, make it make some sense for you. Uh, all right, so now we're on to uh, ratios, uh, ratios, financial ratios and their uses again. Uh, and same thing, so we said four or five here in our exam. Uh, I provided some ledger entries here so we could go over these questions together. So uh, I provided a company balance sheet and I stipulated it has current assets of 40 million. It has of that $40 million in current assets, it has 20 million in inventory. It has uh, current liabilities of 10, so I just stipulated that. And so the current ratio is going to be, uh, by the way, it doesn't show up in the NASA uh, test specifications here, but uh, I would know working capital, That's it's testable, it's just not in this area of the PDF that we're explicating, but you know, working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. A uh, current ratio is current assets uh, divided by current liabilities. And so in the uh, it, ledger entries I've provided here, it'd be 40 million uh, divide by 10 million. And we find out it's four to one. Uh, quick ratio, we don't wanna have to sell out for inventory to pay bills. So uh, the quick assets, so, you know, to do quick ratio, this is also known, let's just put that up. This is also known as acid test ratio. So quick or acid test ratio. And to get this, we're gonna take the uh, quick assets. Oops, sorry, I'm gonna get a different color here for you. And we're gonna divide by the current liabilities. And uh, the quick assets or doesn't count the inventory. So, you know, here we would toss out the inventory. We said, well, we have 40 million in current assets, but you know, acid test quick, we don't wanna to have to turn inventory into cash quickly. So we're gonna toss out that. And that means we have quick assets of 20 million that's the current less the inventory. Uh, we divide by 10 million and we find out that's a two to one. So we have $2 in every asset uh, for every dollar we owe. So that's not too bad. Uh, debt to equity, debt to equity. I stipulated here that the company has long-term debt of 40 million, that's bonds, long-term bonds that have been issued. It has shareholder equity of uh, 50 million. And so I have stipulated this company has total capitalization, because we capitalize a company with equity and debt, uh, total capitalization of 90 million. Now, what we wanted to do here is see how much of that 90 million uh, belongs to uh, you know our, our creditors, our bondholders. So we're gonna take the debt and we're gonna divide it by total cap. Uh, it sounds, this one's kind of confusing because it says it's you know debt to equity, but it's actually debt divided by total capitalization. And so in our example, that would be 50 million divided by 90 million And we get here, there's my calculator, 50 divided by 90. We find out that 55 cents of every dollar belongs to our, our bondholders. Uh, this is a solvency one here. So this is about the solvency of the corporation, you know, whether they may go bankrupt or not. And uh, these up here are about liquidity. Uh, 
Uh, all right, valuation ratios. Uh, I can't imagine any draw in which you're not going to get asked to do uh, price to earnings or understand it as something to make comparisons amongst companies. And so I uh, gave you an example here of a company that has a uh, price of 48. By the way, the vast majority of the test is division. So if you can't decide what to do, hit the divide key. And so you simply take uh, 40 eight divided by four and you would tell me the price to earnings is 12. It takes us 12 years in earnings to get back what we just paid in price. Uh, this is another one I can't imagine you're not going to get. So we said there's four or five questions here. We know we're going to get uh, the PE ratio. We know we're getting that and we know we're getting negative correlation for sure. So that takes care of, you know, two of those five, right? So, you know, when you're trying to decide how much time to devote to this stuff, I haven't anybody in years tell me they had to do or you saw anything about price to book, but as a value investor, if I'm looking for a margin of safety, perhaps I want to buy a, a, a company close to price to book. Book represents the liquidation value of the corporation. We don't suppose we're going to do that, but I mean, you know, it gives me a margin of safety to say the business can be liquidated for X number of dollars. So, you know, if it was price, by the way, we, we expect the company, the corporation would have a, um, a, a price of its stock that's higher than this book. Because if not, you know, somebody's gonna try and liquidate. Okay, so uh, I hope you're finding these explications helpful. Uh, please let me know because, you know, as I started these explications, uh, I said, you know, if nobody likes them, we'll just hit the delete button and we'll stop. But uh, we have completed the SIE. Uh, we're getting close to completing the explication on the seven. We haven't started the six. That'll probably, I feel sorry for my series six folks. That'll be probably last, unfortunately. Uh, we have uh, started the uh, 65. This will make the uh, second installment on that explica explication. And 66 is uh, this will make your first uh, installment on your explication. So we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. There's other content uh, for 65, 66, but I, I recognize that we need more. And so I will continue to build up uh, this uh, content for you on the YouTube channel. Uh, like, subscribe, and as I said, uh, put in the comments or questions you have in the comment box, and I'll see you for the next explication. Uh, please let me know if you find it helpful. Uh, and, you know, test day. I don't uh, agree to do the publishing schedule based on people's test date, but, you know, if you're a loyal YouTube uh, subscriber and, you know, you interact with me, there's a guy I know testing when, uh, Wednesday. I'm trying to get some more stuff out to him before then, so.